Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. I know it's the day after, but still Merry Christmas. The 12 days of Christmas, I guess, technically began yesterday. Uh, the church, as we begin this morning, I want to take a moment to just read Psalm 113 before we enter into a time of praise and worship together this morning. The heading of Psalm 113 in the ESV Bible says, Who is like the Lord our God? And the psalmist writes this, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Who is like the Lord our God this morning? The same Lord that we celebrated Friday night and yesterday and we continue to celebrate each and every day of our lives, came and took on flesh to meet a need that we could never meet ourselves. That is the Lord that we celebrate this morning. That is the Lord that we worship this morning. Would you pray with me as we begin our service? <clears throat> Father, this morning we come to you with hearts proclaiming what Psalm 113 proclaims. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Lord, each every day as, as the sun rises, as the sun sets, would you allow us to remember you in all things, to praise you in all things, to worship you in all things, to give you the adoration that you deserve. Lord, as we have celebrated through this Advent season and as we continue to celebrate, you are a God who makes a way where there is no way. You are a God who shines a bright light in an unpierceable darkness. We thank you that right now we can know that you are seated on high. We are told you're high above all nations, your glory above the heavens. You are a God who is fully and completely in control. Would you remind us of that? In all seasons, and particularly seasons of chaos and calamity in this life, Lord, remind us that you are high above it all and that you are in control. There is nothing happening on this earth. There is nothing happening in this universe that is of any surprise to you, God. And I thank you that you are sovereign above all things. Lord, this morning, as we reflect now on the days after the birth of your son. What did the days and years after look like? Would you be with us? Remind us that the, the son who came, the child who was given, is not just to be celebrated in the Advent season, but every single day of our lives, no matter the season, no matter the month. Be with us now as we worship you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. So glad to see you here this morning. Let's all stand together. As we enter into a time of worship and praise to our King, praise to Emmanuel, who is God with us this very minute. So, Lord, we give you our praise this morning. We're reminded that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And you never leave us or forsake us, Jesus. So, Lord, we sing your praises today. We sing about the wonder of who you are, about how you do great things, how you restore, how you redeem, how you revive. So Jesus, lead us in worship. Lead us with expectant hearts that you move within us, God, and fill our time here this morning with your love and your mercy, your truth, your grace, and your forgiveness, Jesus. In your name. Amen. Savior is not. 
church, here we are this morning to worship. Here we are to praise our King. Here we are to worship Emmanuel, God, with us. Amen. So, Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy, God. Here we are in this place. Lord, you've given us another day. Another day to worship you, Jesus. Another day where you fill our lungs with air where we can exhale your glory. We can exhale who you are, Jesus, and proclaim who you are, Lord. Lord, you are worthy of all praise. And here we are in this place to worship our King. Church, morning. pray that Christmas yesterday was uh, a time of, of great joy, time spent with those that you love, but more than that, I pray that uh, no matter who the day was spent with, no matter what gifts were given, no matter how much food was consumed around the table together, I pray that uh, this whole season of Christmas has been a meaningful time uh, of reflection on the ultimate gift in the form of Christ Jesus some 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. Uh, we have reflected over this last week, last Sunday and Friday night, we have reflected on uh, the way Isaiah describes the coming Savior, the way he describes Jesus 700 some years before his birth. In Isaiah chapter 7 and Isaiah chapter 9, we looked at some of the the popular hymns that we sing around Christmas time on Friday night and what those hymns say about him, which of course comes directly from the scriptures as well, that he is the one who met the hopes and fears of all generations of all the years that night in Bethlehem. That he is, as we just sang again a moment ago, a common theme in the worship that we sing and what we see in the scriptures, that he is still and will always be Emmanuel, God with us, God in relationship with us. And we look at the fact that he is and was born to be not just our savior, but born to be our friend who walks with us through all kinds of trials that we will face in this life through the Holy Spirit. So it has been a joy to celebrate uh, this Christmas season with each and every one of you. And this morning, I actually want to go back to uh, the scripture that we read uh, on Friday night. I want to go back to Luke chapter 2, again, looking at the birth of Jesus together this morning. And uh, I rarely, if ever, uh, title my sermons. Um, I'm just not a creative person, and so I choose not to do so. And so, uh, but the, the phrase that I've been kind of reflecting on and thinking about uh, since Friday night, really just over the last day and a half, is uh, now what? And I feel like this is a common question we tend to subconsciously ask ourselves after a, a big life moment, after something big happens in our lives, when things are returning to normal, I think it, it is a common question to ask, now what? After the shepherds came and they worshipped him that night. Now what for them? After Mary delivered this baby boy into the world, Mary and Joseph welcomed their son. Now what? Now where do we go from here? Uh, before we dive back in this morning, just one quick announcement, one quick reminder that Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we will be here again for 5Q Discipleship. That will be downstairs in the adult Sunday school room. Again, that's Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Uh, we invite anyone who would like to join us for that, please join us this Wednesday at 6. So church, if you do have your Bibles uh, along with you this morning, turn with me for a moment to Luke chapter 2. 
Again, this is the, the passage that we read to begin our, our service on Friday night. And in doing so, like I said, I've just been pondering what it says here for us. Not just, you know, we've, we've heard the Christmas story so many times. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. We hear this story so many times throughout our lives. And we tend to focus a lot on the story itself of his birth. But I want us to look really at the last handful of verses here that look at the after of his birth. And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, looking again at verse 1 to verse 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swallowing cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Now I want us to focus on particularly these last Several verses, starting in verse 17. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. As I said, this is a story we've heard many times, and Friday night was a time of great joy. Again, reading this story together and celebrating and rejoicing in that news that the shepherds heard from the angel that night, that the, the, to the world, a savior was born that night. To all mankind, a child was born and a son was given. But as I have thought about the fact that uh, you know, Christmas was on a Saturday this year, and I kept asking myself, really, over the last couple of weeks and, and months even, I thought, with, with the day after Christmas being a Sunday, what will we talk about that next day? What will we do the day after Christmas? What do we do when the anticipation of that day is over? As I have readied myself for Christmas Eve this year and began to look at, at Luke 2, I immediately noticed that we see very clearly three distinct things that were done after this night and that we are called to do after reflecting on this night in Bethlehem. Firstly, we see both the shepherds wondering and Mary pondering. The birth of Jesus was a cause of great wonder to everyone who was involved. I imagine most people here this morning, if you grew up in the church, depending on your age, I imagine you have heard the story of Jesus' birth recounted and retold dozens, if not hundreds of times through the years. And I believe it is a part simply of human nature that when we hear the same things over and over and over again, that repetition over time can sometimes 
bring a slight indifference towards that thing that we have heard many times. When we hear the same thing over and over, I, I do it every single time I find a song that I really like. I can't help myself, and so I listen to it over and over and over again. And within a week and a half, I'm, I'm good. I don't need to hear that anymore for another year. And maybe I'll obsess with it again at some point later on. And I feel that this sometimes this is kind of what we do with human nature. We, we hear things, we, uh, we take things in over and over and over again, and we begin to subconsciously become a little bit indifferent towards it. We feel like we know it fully. And maybe over time it doesn't carry the same weight for us as it did the first time that we heard it. But when it comes to the story of Christmas, I think we need to pray for a fresh sense of wonder and awe at the story of Jesus coming into this world. That he would come to a world so desperate for a savior and be that savior. That the God of our universe would take on flesh, that he would know temptation, that he would willingly take on weakness is worthy of our all, and it is certainly worthy of our pondering as well. Mary herself knew exactly who her baby boy was. The angels made it very clear to her. It's the reason so many of us find Mary, did you know, a little bit annoying during December, because the resounding answer is yes, she absolutely did. She knew who her baby boy was, but in spite of her knowing, exactly who he was and that he was Christ the Lord sent by God the Father. She was still given pause by what the shepherds tell her that night about what the angels proclaimed about her baby boy. That her baby boy was a savior was a statement that not only she treasured, but Luke tells us she pondered these things in her heart. If Mary, the one chosen by God to bring his son into the world, the one who knew him, who had, her, or had him in her womb, pondered over who he was and what he was there to do, does that not mean we should ponder all the more who this Savior is? To sit and reflect on and revel in the majesty of Jesus. To ponder is to feel the weight that he has called those who know him as Savior and Lord righteous. Not because of what we have done, but because of who he is and what he has done for us. Let not only the birth of Jesus be caused at all times for a sense of wonder and a sense of pondering, but ponder in your heart every single day his greatness displayed all throughout his life on earth. We see the shepherds wondering. We see Mary pondering. But secondly, we also see great praise being shared. Verse 20 says, the shepherds returned. Imagine how that night began for them, just a simple night of work like any other. And then this, this life-altering moment. And that night, after all was said and done, after they had seen Jesus and they had met Mary and Joseph, they had to return to their flocks. But I will tell you this morning, church, they returned as different men than when they left to go and seek him. They returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Unlike the shepherds, we were not there and we will never be there in person to witness the birth of the Son of God into this world. The fact that he came for you and for me, the fact that he would be born of Mary for all of mankind, that he was the child who Isaiah said would be born for us and given to us, should at all moments lead us directly to the throne of grace in complete and total worship and praise of our God, just as it does for the shepherds here. What was, the, what was the reason for the praise and the, the glorifying of the shepherds? We're told directly in verse 20, they glorified and praised God, not only for what they had seen with their eyes, but they praised him because of what they had heard with their ears as well. That there was 
good news of great joy the angels proclaimed over him. This was not a somber night. This was a night of great joy and rejoicing. And we get just a glimpse, I think, of what was happening happening in heaven that night from the, the angel coming. And then it says a multitude of the heavenly hosts were there and praised God, saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he has pleased. This is a night of great joy. It's a night of great celebration. And it is a night of praise and glory. Church, that statement, what those shepherds heard from the angel that night, and by extension, what we are still hearing as it's being proclaimed again and again here through the scriptures, should bring us to a place of worship and praise. A savior has been born to you, to us as a church, to you individually, to the whole world. It's good news of great joy for all people. The baby boy they proclaimed that night came from God, and he is your Savior, your King, your Christ, your gift. And that is worthy of your praise. We are called to wonder, to ponder, and to praise. But church, lastly, we are called to go and proclaim. Verses 17 and 18. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. When the angels came to the shepherds that night in the field and proclaimed that there was good news of great joy. They said it was good news of great joy for all people. The news they shared with them that night is not news that was meant to be contained. It was not news that was meant just for the shepherds. This was news, this was for all people, and it was meant to be shared and shared joyously. And it's why the shepherds Go. At our last 5Q discipleship discussion a week and a half ago, uh, we talked together a little bit uh, about evangelism. And throughout the last few years here, you've heard me share a good deal of my, my thoughts on evangelism that everyone who is a follower of Jesus is called to proclaim Jesus. We are called to tell others in our lives about his goodness and about his salvation. The Great Commission is is a commission for every single disciple of Jesus. Not just someone with a title of pastor, not just someone in some kind of ministry capacity. If we proclaim him as savior, we are to make it known that he is savior. And you have heard me say through the years, evangelism is not about knowing the exact right things to say. It's not about having all the answers, though we will find that when we diligently study the scriptures, and trust in his Holy Spirit, very often we will know what to say in those moments through his Spirit. But evangelism does not mean it is our job to convince someone of who Jesus is. It is our job to proclaim who he is, to tell them of what he has done in our lives, to show them his goodness through being his hands and feet. And only God can change someone's heart. And within the last few weeks or even months, I have felt uh, a bit of a conviction on my own that I shared at 5Q, uh, and I shared that uh, proclaiming Jesus, sharing who he is, is not something that we do fearfully. Evangelizing and sharing Jesus should not do, or should not be something that we do just from simply a place of obligation of, well, I, I have to do this. It should be to us, just as it was for the shepherds, a great joy. It should be life-giving to us to proclaim to the world who Jesus is. Evangelism should not be scary. It should be joyous. And I think when we think about evangelism, when we sit and reflect on the fact that we are called to the Great Commission, if we feel fear <coughs> towards that, when we think about uh, evangelizing as something that's scary, I think very often the reason is because we're putting far too much pressure on ourselves. When we are called to do nothing more than joyously proclaim who he is and what he has done in our lives. 
And that is to be done not through our own strength. I think when we think about evangelism, it makes us fearful. We often think, I have to do this on my own. Evangelism can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells. Only the Holy Spirit can change someone's heart and someone's mind. That is not your job, church. So this morning, as we come to the end of this Advent season, what I would say to you this morning is this. Just because Advent is over, just because the Christmas music will soon stop, and maybe for some of you that's a good thing, uh, just because the trees will soon be taken down and, and put away or put out, just because the gifts have been given, that does not mean we should not be in awe every single day of a God who came and took on flesh. That awe of Jesus coming to earth and taking on flesh should not just be something we feel during the month of December or during the Advent season. It should be something we find all in every single day of our lives. And it should be something we proclaim joyously every single day of our lives. Through what we say, how we live, and particularly through how we love others. And finally, as we transition out of the Christmas season, be diligent to prayerfully and faithfully find yourself wondering, pondering, praising, and proclaiming because he is worthy of all of those things. As the worship team comes, as we prepare to close this morning, would you pray with me that as a church we would be strengthened to do these things. Lord, we come to you this morning with a sense of awe that you didn't just make a way, God, but you came and took on flesh for all people. Lord, as we transition out of the Christmas season, as we begin to step into the year 2022, I pray that there would not be a day that goes by where we do not find ourselves in awe of how incredible that is and how great of a God you are. You truly are worthy of everything. So Lord, as we reflect not just on Jesus taking on flesh and coming to earth, but his whole life, on the fact that he went to the cross for all people, would you, through your Holy Spirit, lead us to a place of wonder, a, pr a place of pondering, that we would reflect on the things of God, a place of praise, that as we reflect on you, we would be led to the throne of grace to openly praise the God who is worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise. And Lord, as we wonder, as we ponder, as we praise, would you help us to joyously proclaim in what we say, in how we live, and how we love others. Help us to, at all moments of our lives, proclaim who Jesus is. Lord, we are not perfect. There are going to be times we slip up. There are going to be times that we fail. But because of who you are and because of what you've done, you still call us righteous. And that is truly something worth wondering, pondering, and praising and proclaiming. Be with us now as we worship and as we close this morning. Be with us as we go into a world that so desperately needs a Savior. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. today. He's my friend. He's my healer. He's my redeemer. And he's my savior. Is he yours today? Is he yours? So what do we do? We just came through Christmas and what do we do next? We continue to adore. We continue to adore and we continue to proclaim the goodness of the Lord with a joyful, a joyful spirit. Amen? Amen? Let's all stand together. As we sing this great song, O oh, come all ye faithful, O oh, come, let us adore him this morning. Church, let's do this.